Good afternoon. Don't go to sleep on me. Um, you can do that during the panel session and kind of work yourself up into that. Uh, uh, I've already warned James not to go to sleep uh, on me, so, and I'll try not to give you reason to go to sleep. It, it uh, is really a, a pleasure to have an opportunity to spend some time with you uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm actually surprised that uh, there's this many people here. When uh, Cynthia first uh, reached out to a number of people about trying to do this, we were hoping that we'd get uh, about 100 people that were interested and uh, 100 uh, first and second line supervisors that were really interested in learning more about evidence-based uh, practice and, um, and how they might uh, help improve that in their own organizations. And so we're delighted to have as many people uh, express interest and actually be here. So, and I, and I hope um, that you've enjoyed the morning. I certainly have, uh, even though I know a, a lot of the folks, I know everybody that's been talking and about some of their work, uh, uh, every one of these opportunities is, uh, is an opportunity for me to continue my process of learning about how we can make policing uh, both more effective but also uh, more efficient, which is really critically important to our world today. Um, I'm going to going to going to talk just to about three areas, um, and real quickly on the first in terms of evidence-based strategy, just to remind you a little bit about uh, what Cynthia and others have have said this morning about that. Um, a lot on on a lot more on problem-oriented policing, and the importance of first-line supervisors and and commanders and what they contribute to that environment and to whether officers actually engage in, uh, in problem solving. Um, and, then, um, and then a couple comments about, about the role of the, uh, of the police supervisor. Um, Cynthia talked this morning, I can't make, did I, what's going on? Thank you. Uh, just, just a reminder about what uh, Cynthia talked about this morning in terms of, of, of evidence-based uh, practice, uh, 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 proactive. And it, that's a, it's kind of a simple idea, and we've been hearing a lot about, about being proactive for a lot of years, but the reality is, is the nature of the work of, the, of folks that spend time on the street is a substantial amount of it continues to be reacting to calls for service reacting to whatever presents itself along the way. Um, and, and in order to, to make that, we have to handle the calls for service as best as we can, but in order to capture the time that we have available to us, uh, Steve, Steve, somebody was golden, who called it the golden go time? The golden time. Uh, Cynthia called it the golden time uh, this morning. In order to capture that time and to make use of that time for something uh, productive, uh, it, it, it takes the first line, it takes the organization to create policies for that to happen, but it takes the first line supervisor to create the opportunity for people to manage that time in a way that uh, uh, is more focused and more directed, which are also key aspects of evidence-based uh, evidence strategy, tailored and focused. If supervisors aren't playing the role to help bring that about, then it's not likely going to happen. One of the things that I've, I've discovered over the years and watched and probably uh, felt pretty much the same way uh, in the time as, as when I was an officer in Kansas City, Missouri, was um, we feel like that the time we're not on the calls for service is ours. It's, it's personal. We own it. And we feel like that we're the best managers and masters of what, how we're going to focus that uh, focus our energy during that time frame. And so it really requires effective supervision to help overcome the resistance that, that our officers are likely to have to us interfering with what they, for the most part, consider their own time. And, and a lot of them actually are doing work, whether it's the work that we want them to do, whether it's the work that would have the greatest return on the investment for that time, or open questions. Some of it is, a lot of it uh, is, whatever it is that they like to do. If, and not that that's not work, if they like to go after auto thieves or they are particularly interested in 
DUI enforcement or whatever it is that they like to do with that time, that's what, what they're going to do with it, left to their own devices. Not a bad thing, but one of the things that we've learned is that if we're directed, if we're focused, if we get into problem solving, the, uh, the return that we get on the investment in officers and in policing our communities is going to be much greater. And, and that's really the strength of the evidence-based uh, uh, evidence strategy. It's not that we have science that tells us what works in every circumstance. I wish we did, but we don't. It's a, and we're a long ways from that. So what we're asking people to do is to, is to work through those problems. Use the best evidence that we have. Look for that evidence. Ask yourself an honest question, is, is what we're doing making a difference? And, and what are the best measures that we have available to us to, uh, to be able to, to make that decision? Uh, and, then, and then finally, place oriented. A lot of the problem solving work, and that's where uh, I've spent a lot of, of my career uh, uh, trying to encourage and to reinforce in, in policing, is, is place oriented. All the way from a single address. Going back for a lot of years, one of the things that, that, uh, uh, that, that I always ask folks in, in, uh, in, in police departments that, that I've had the privilege of, of leading was uh, to look at repeat calls. That's one of the easiest, best ways that you can begin to identify where your problems are, looking at repeat calls. The, the, uh, several people mentioned how concentrated crime and calls for service are. We've known that for a very long time. We've known that almost the whole time that I've been in policing, back into the late 60s. But we didn't do anything with it. We didn't take that fundamental knowledge that we have and try to turn that into something where we could improve our efficiency and effectiveness. So all the way from uh, addresses and micro locations to uh, larger hotspots, areas that we know that it's concentrated, it just makes common sense to me that that's where we ought to be directing a lot of the, uh, the energy that we have. If you're looking at, at uh, problem oriented policing, um, I, I had the opportunity um, uh, as a police chief in Newport News, Virginia, to, uh, uh, to try to implement uh, problem-oriented policing in a department for officers that were on the street. We had not had much experience in 1984 with, uh, with problem solving. Had, a, had some work that Herman Goldstein did in Madison uh, that was predominantly uh, 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 a centralized effort with uh, researchers, a couple of researchers in, at the university working with the department and looking at uh, problems and, 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 and then trying to implement ideas from that analysis. Baltimore County, Maryland, um, at their COPE unit specialist, 45 officers that were, their full-time work was to work in that unit and, and they had used problem solving uh, to, uh, to focus on the different areas that they had. We had not had an effort where officers that both responded to call, that responded to calls were responsible for a beat to try to do problem solving and that's what we set out to do in Newport News was to, was to, to take the officer that on the street and try to manage their time in a way that they could not only handle their calls for service, but they could do, uh, engage in problem solving. And we did that. Uh, we did that in Newport News, uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, um, uh, Charlotte, Mecklenburg, and, in, and actually lots of departments all across the country uh, over from about 1985 up until so just recently, I think uh, we've, we've gotten in all kinds of directions, so there's probably been a little bit less influence on, on, on uh, problem solving. But, but we've clearly demonstrated over the years that, uh, that police officers have, have very much have the capacity to do problem solving um, if they have the support. The SARE model that uh, Cynthia mentioned this morning was, was actually created in Newport News. Uh, during that time. Um, uh, I didn't create it. I, I don't want to take the credit for that, but it was John Eck and Bill Spellman and, and a task force of officers that were working on this project in Newport News that, that created this process for, for doing problem solving. What, what I did 
uh, as the chief was insist that we have a process. Herman's, Herman's look at, at, uh, at, at problems um, was, was good, um, but pretty complicated for most police officers to be able to do. Pretty complicated. And so we wanted to try to get some process that most any police officer could do. That's what, that's what we did. That's what was developed. And there's been police departments all over the country, in fact, uh, across the world, that have, uh, that have made some revisions and that kind of thing. But that fundamental process is something that puts some structure around it. And that's what we were, that's what we were really trying to do so that we can have officers that can be engaged in that. Those are the three departments that I, that I spent the most time in personally working on problem solving issues and trying to create a culture where that happens. And in every one of those departments, the places where officers got fully engaged and invested in problem solving uh, were the places where they had supervisors that had, were of like mind. That supervisors that would, would spend time with them. Supervisors that would help schedule uh, them maybe away from handling calls for a couple of hours so that they could have the time that's necessary to follow up with a piece of work or expand their analysis or, or that type of thing. Not that you didn't have officers that, that, uh, that didn't do some things without the support of their supervisors, but that was pretty rare. So if you had a good sergeant, you had a good captain or a lieutenant um, that was supportive of this kind of policing, then you had a lot of really positive things taking place within your organization. I want to share with you some evidence from two departments, San Diego and, and, uh, and Charlotte Mecklenburg next. This is a, a series of surveys that um, uh, Gary Cordner did in San Diego a few years ago, uh, just trying to, to get an understanding of what was going on in the San Diego Police Department, how officers felt about what was going on from a problem-solving uh, perspective. San Diego was a police department that, that uh, was a leader in the implementation of, of uh, problem-oriented policing. They got involved with it in the late 80s around, uh, uh, initially on a, on a grant that PERF had that helped them uh, looking at drug problems. But, but San Diego took it to pretty far along, probably as far or further along than probably any large police department in the country did at the time. They were really invested in it. They worked hard at it. And so Gary, um, it, uh, this has been now about 10 years ago, uh, San Diego had been at it about 13 or 14 years at the time, went out on, on a grant, did some surveys. 71% um, uh, of the officers in that department were actually engaged in problem solving. 71%. Look at the next three bullets. Sergeants provided time. 75% of those problems that, that those officers were working on, sergeants were involved in providing the time. 40% of the time, the sergeants were engaged enough to actually give them some ideas. Isn't that what sergeants are supposed to do? Coach. And that's, that's part of, that's the coaching part. 20% of the time, the sergeants weren't just providing advice, they were actually engaged and involved. And almost 80% of the time, sergeants were asking about problems and following up with officers on their work. That, I mean, to a lot of you, that seems, well, so what? I mean, that's, that's what we do. The, the reality is, is a lot of supervisors don't do that. They don't talk about the work with their officers. They certainly talk about the complaints and the procedures and the different things that are going on, but actually have a conversation with them about a particular problem that, that they're working on or a particular issue or saying to an officer, look, I, I did a run on repeat call locations and you've got a, 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 a convenience store uh, over here that, uh, that I've noticed that, uh, that uh, over the last uh, two months that we've made about 75 calls for service to. What's going on there? Right in the middle of, of, of your area of responsibility. Can you take a look at that? A lot of that doesn't happen in the normal day-to-day -day course of, of the work we do. And, and, 
and sometimes it doesn't happen because there are times of our days and days of our week where that all is all we do is respond to calls for service, but that's not the way it is all, all the time. It's just not that way. And when you look at the data, it, it is very, very clear. One of the things that they, that they asked about were, were what kind of things, what kind of support and encouragement would, uh, would officers feel would be even more supportive. And this is in a department where 70% of the people, 70% of their officers were already engaged in problem solving. Um, and they're saying even more encouragement from supervisors would be a good thing. One of the things that was uh, kind of surprising to me when I, when I saw it was that they're saying, um, let's, uh, let's brain, uh, apparently they would get together occasionally and, and, and talk about the issues that they're working on, and, and, and police officers appreciated that. More time, creating more time where they could brainstorm solutions to these different problems, and, and the other is direct mentoring in the field. When I started as a police officer in 1968, Kansas City, Missouri, um, the sergeant, the first sergeant I ever had, uh, we'd do the roll call, and uh, and the end of the roll call, uh, he would didn't say go be safe or any of that. He would say, um, "Don't call me. I'll call you if I need you." <laughs> and that was typical. I mean, they just. They would show up if there's problems or that kind of thing, or, you know, all hell had broken loose. Otherwise, they didn't want to have anything to do with you. Just don't create waves, don't create problems. Certainly not the model of what we think a supervisor should be uh, today. Uh, and then, then the final one was, uh, was crime analysis support. Uh, in Charlotte, um, uh, this was a, a doctoral dissertation that was done uh, by a student um, uh, from uh, University, Sam Walker's uh, student, uh, University of uh, Nebraska in Omaha, uh, looked at, at our department uh, in 2006, 2007 uh, time frame, uh, looking at, as we, we, were, we felt that we had, had actually had an impact on the culture of the organization, that we were engaged in, in, uh, in problem-oriented policing in a way that was pretty much inculcated throughout the department. Um, it wasn't just my time. I followed Dennis and Wiki, who had been there for five years, and and we we had a, were of like mind about problem solving, and so we sustained that for a period of time. Uh, and the the results of surveys that uh, the Trent did, um, three quarters of of the supervisors, these were surveys of officers and about their supervisors. Had uh, indicated the officers indicated that it was very clear to them that their supervisors valued uh, problem solving, that they're encouraged uh, to doing it, that they actually had informal conversations with supervisors about problems, uh, and almost half. I mean, there's there's uh, almost half of them uh, felt like that it was not something that they were just expected to do. They thought that it was a valuable uh, tool for them to effectively do their work. In Charlotte, uh, it was a part of their performance appraisal. Uh, we, we thought that if you, if you uh, wanted people to do it, then you ought to measure it, and you ought to, they ought to get credit for doing it. Uh, we, we had uh, processes where it actually was incorporated into the promotion system. So it, it, it created a culture that reinforced this kind of policing. The organization uh, supported that, uh, and it was clear that the, the supervisors, the contribution that they made to that was the difference in, in how people thought about it, how much they engaged in it, and the quality of work uh, that, they, that they actually did. So it sort of, sort of brings me to a few points that I think um, are important for the role of the supervisor in, um, in evidence-based policing, problem solving, hotspots, uh, all of that. Um, first is, is encourage creative thinking. It's, I've been, I have been um, really amazed and pleased over the years as I have talked to police officers about 
about problems and, and, and trying to come up with different ways to, to focus on them. One of the challenges that we have in, this, in, in our business in problem solving, even though officers are engaged in it, is they tend to feel most comfortable with implementing solutions that are law enforcement based, that are enforcement based. That, and part of that is because they can control that. They, they don't have to engage the community as much in doing that. They don't have to convince other people that they can, they can play a role in that. But it's amazing some of the creative solutions that, that officers have come up with that are not enforcement based. One of, the, one of the things that I think it's important for supervisors to do is certainly part of the solution, uh, are, are you're gonna end up in enforcement based, but, but as much as we can do to, to create an environment where we can prevent as opposed to relying on the criminal justice system to be a part of the solution, we're better off. We're better off. Fewer victims, fewer problems and challenges that you have to deal with in going through that, that process. Uh, community orientation. Community orientation. We have struggled for years in, in, in our profession um, <clears throat> with, with putting the community in the proper perspective. We focus a lot on our own internally. We focus a lot on what's important to us. We focus a lot on, on, on structuring our schedules and our processes and that kind of thing uh, to, to work for us. Uh, not as much on putting that community as, which is really the purpose that we're here, who we're here to serve, and putting that in the proper perspective. And, and, and our work, understanding what that perspective is. Uh, <clears throat> the SARA model has the two A's, uh, scanning analysis, response, and assessment. And the two weakest parts of problem solving always be, has been, and, and I think it's getting better because we have technology and some analytical systems that we didn't used to have before. Those are the two weakest parts. And that's why I think we jumped into enforcement responses because that's kind of the first and the most immediate solution that we come to. Good analysis, good assessment, that's where I think supervisors can play a really critical role in, in, in pushing officers to go a little bit further in trying to understand that problem. Pushing officers and asking the hard question is, uh, do, do these results really indicate that, uh, that, that they're having an impact on the problem that we, that, uh, that we hoped it would? Is the response the right one? Are there other ways to approach this? If something fails, that's not, I mean, it's, to me, it's not a failure. It just, it, it didn't work, so we've got to loop back and figure out a way that we can, we can go back in and resolve that problem in, in some way. Uh, coaching, facilitating, and motivator. Really critical roles for supervisors. Really critical roles for supervisors. One of the, the things that I used to do um, in Charlotte, as we, we did, well, we just did several week courses for people when they were getting promoted. From sergeants, we'd do a class. Going to captains, we'd do a class. And, and I would spend, um, during that three week period, um, uh, about 16 hours with the group at, at different times during the, uh, during the session. And, um, and, and in talking about leadership, um, I had this one class in particular, there were 12, uh, people that uh, were getting promoted to captain uh, over the next six to eight months that we had in this class. Ask them, uh, who, who, who did you really admire as a leader? One of the people, uh, two types, one that was outside of policing, one that was in policing. And there were 12 people in this class, and in that class there were seven of them. It's not something that they had a discussion about when they asked him to put that down. There were seven of them that named one sergeant in the department that all that these seven people had had contact with over their careers up to that point at different times that they admired. And as we started exploring uh, why they admired him, it, it wasn't because he was easy. He wasn't. 
he was, he was a very challenging person for them to work for. But he, he, he pushed them a lot further than, he, than they thought they, they could go. He angered them a lot of times because, he, because of the way that he pushed them. He challenged them, but he also rewarded them, recognized them, thanked them for doing a good job. And, and for some reason, and it, was, I thought it had never happened before or since, that this one cohort of, of people, this one sergeant had that much influence on, on this group of people who had all, by all measures, uh, in that department were pretty successful to be getting ready to go into the position of captain. This guy had actually retired, because um, uh, I, I didn't know him, and I went to find him, to talk to him, uh, because uh, I had never had that happen before, and, but it goes to show you how important that sergeant can be, and, and he wasn't out to being liked. People loved him, but that wasn't his objective at all. His objective was to help people be good at their job, be safe, and, and, uh, and to actually learn uh, to, 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 to like the work. Uh, very interesting guy and very uh, much the kind of sergeant that I would have liked to, for every one of them to be in the department. Uh, but it's just remarkable. Uh, and then, um, you know, that, that I, think, I think it's so critical as we move into the supervisory uh, middle management, management positions, and then running the department, that, that we remember how important it is to actually spend time with folks, give them good feedback, recognize them, challenge them, and push them on to doing the kind of things that, that, uh, that contribute to our entire community being safe. Um, thanks for the time, and thanks for being here.